Hey, this is Leo for Actualized.org. And here, I'm going to attempt to explain all of religion in one video. One of the most fascinating questions that we encounter as human beings living this social existence and having this one life that we live through and we go through and discover all this stuff about what life is, is the existence of religions. Not just one religion, but many, many, many religions. And it's very fascinating how seriously people take their religions, how passionate they are about them how they're willing to fight to the death to defend them, and also how science plays into this, and the whole history of religion. So in this video, I want to tackle this topic. Uh, it's a pretty big topic to tackle, and it's going to play out in a much different way than you probably think. Now, let me preface by saying that this is my personal perspective, all right? This is my personal perspective from a lot of uh, study that I've done. And I haven't done study so much on religions, but I've done study on philosophy, and I've done study on personal development, and most recently, I've done a lot of study on consciousness. What is consciousness? And that led me to the study of enlightenment, and what is enlightenment? And all of this has very interesting ramifications for my understanding of religions. In fact, I just came back from, a, from an enlightenment workshop. I spent seven days immersed in a workshop. Uh, Mind-blowing, profound realizations that I've had. I'm, I'm seeing reality differently now from that workshop. And I'm seeing religion in a more clear light, at least in my opinion. And so I wanted just to share some of my insights with you about religion, if you're kind of curious about this. You know, just kind of for curiosity's sake. Um... And, you know, I used to be an atheist for pretty much most of my life, ever, ever since um, so I remember, remember debating some really religious friend that I had in high school uh, and just not understanding how someone could be so religious. He was a Christian, a Protestant, I believe. I don't exactly remember which denomination, but he was a really, really, really devout Christian. Um, and I just, I couldn't grasp it because... From a scientific, rational perspective, religions don't make a lot of sense. And yet, you've got so many people believing in religions. And so you start to wonder, like, well, how could this be? How could you have billions of people so bought into religion? And if religions are false, which is what the scientific perspective says about them, that they're just kind of fairy tales and stories and myths, then why are there so many similarities between different religions and how could religions have gotten such a strong foothold on culture and society? It's a very deep and perplexing question that's not as easy to answer as you might think. Now, I'm going to warn you that you're not going to like what I have to say in this video if you're rationally minded. And I am rationally minded too, but I've gone through a long journey of exploring lots of different stuff, and I'm extremely, extremely, extremely open-minded. So this has helped me in my ability to investigate this stuff. But what I find is that a lot of rational people, they're rational, but they're actually also very similar to religious people. Sometimes very scientifically minded or rational, or even atheistic person will think that they're 180 degrees away from religion. But actually, what I'm going to suggest to you is that if you are that type of person, that you have a lot more in common with religious people than you like to admit. And we'll get to that as we continue. Also, though, even though I'm going to be saying some stuff here that your rational mind is not going to like, this video is not a defense of religion. And in the end, what I'm going to tell you is that you should be dropping religious beliefs if you've got any. 
So let's just start cracking into it. Uh, another important caveat that I want to make here is that what I'm going to be telling you in this video is going to really strain your rational mind. But everything I tell you here will be empirical. I'm making empirical, factual, verifiable claims that I claim you can verify in your own direct experience. So this is not going to be some mystical talk. This is not going to be like most religious talk, which is just talk about stuff that you're supposed to have faith in and believe on blind faith and really there's nothing tangible that you can verify or not verify, prove or disprove. What I'm telling you here is going to be very provable if you want it, if you want to prove it. It's going to take a little bit of work though. So the core problem here between this whole religion versus science debate is that human beings are extremely, extremely dogmatic. Dogmatic, that's the key word here, dogmatic. What does dogmatic mean? Dogmatic doesn't pertain to religions or to science or to any particular thing. Dogmatic means that you cling to a particular worldview or belief. Now, when you do this, you don't tell yourself that you're clinging to a worldview or to a belief. What you tell yourself is that you have the facts and that this is just a fact and it's true. It doesn't feel like you're clinging to anything. But in fact, what you are doing is you're clinging and this closes your mind down and doesn't permit you to do a very exhaustive, open-minded search. Right? So the trick here is not only are we dogmatic, but we lie to ourselves about being dogmatic, right? We don't honestly tell ourselves that we're dogmatic. We just behave dogmatically and we do this unconsciously. And we will defend often to the death our dogmatism, denying that it's dogmatism. So this is not a problem of religion. This is a problem of the human psyche, right? This is a problem of the human psyche because when the human psyche takes on a core assumption or belief, no matter what it is, whether it's a religious one or something totally different, it doesn't really matter. You cling to it, you make it a part of your self-identity. You make it a part of your self-image, and when you do that, you identify with it and you feel like you need to defend it. And that's why having a discussion about religion at the dinner table will often turn into some heated debate or argument where people's feelings get hurt, is because we don't just treat this logically, intellectually, rationally. We treat these issues emotionally, right? They trigger us emotionally. And don't think that just because you have a rational way of looking at the world that you are not dogmatic. See, your rational way of looking at the world is still emotionally grounded and it triggers just as easily in you, so let's say a rational person, as it would in a religious, dogmatic, fanatical person. This is a very common mistake that I see uh, atheists making, is that they think that just because they're an atheist that they're not dogmatic. Well, what I find in practice is that most atheists are actually very, very, very dogmatic. And this upsets them to hear because they like to use this as a separation between themselves and religious people, but actually you're on the same side on that point, right? The difference you have with religious people is that you have a different kind of dogmatism. What I'm going to suggest to you here, though, is that you'd be much better served to move away from dogmatism entirely, because then you could see this whole debate from a much higher elevated viewpoint, and you can get a lot of perspective and a lot of emotional release from giving up your dogmatism. But this is a tricky thing to do. See, another problem here is that rational people see religion as foolish, right? Why? Well, because we go out into the world, and this is, you know, how I thought for most of my life, is that I, I'm here in, in life and I don't see any supernatural phenomenon. I don't see any gods. I don't see any miracles. I don't see Zeus, you know, throwing thunderbolts on, onto the earth. Um, I don't see any supernatural stuff, so why would I assume that supernatural stuff exists? And because of this 
you know, fundamental incongruity, basically religion looks like a hoax because religion is talking about supernatural deities and beings and and miracles happening and all this stuff. But then you look at, at real life and you're like, dude, I mean, just get real. What are you talking about? This stuff is clearly not here. What are you smoking? Right? So that's that's one issue we've got here. Um, but really, you have to ask yourself, why does religion exist? Not just one, but many, many religions. And these religions, it's not like they're all just totally random, different religions. They seem to have a lot of common elements and threads between them. Even though superficially they might look very different, also from a big picture point of view, they all sound and start to converge and look very similar. So why is this going on? Very interesting question. You have to think about this question very open-mindedly, though, because I see a lot of explanations that come to mind, and I mean, I've come up with these explanations for myself when I was younger, and I've, you know, I've read books and heard other people talk about uh, what the origins of religion might be. And I want to suggest that the following origins, which I want to list off, are not good explanations. So one explanation you might think, well, religion is just primitive stupidity, right? Primitive cultures, thousands of years ago, they really didn't understand life, didn't understand themselves, they didn't understand how the mind works or science, and so they just were basically foolish, and their primitive ideas somehow evolved into these organized religions. I want to suggest to you that that's not a really good explanation. Nor do I think religion is merely superstition that's been formalized and codified. I don't think that's a really good explanation either. Nor do I think that tradition is a good explanation for what religion is and why it originated. It's not merely from tradition that these things arose. There seems to be a much stronger force at play there than just tradition. Because there's a lot of different kinds of tradition that we could have had that was not mystical or religion-based or God-based. Nor do I think that this explanation of religion as a social, political, controlling mechanism is a satisfactory explanation. For example, some people would say that, well, the reason religion existed is to control the masses, right? Especially in the old days where the masses were really stupid and uh, there was less social structures. We didn't even have countries. We had like city-states and tribes. That in this kind of environment, you basically needed some kind of abstract system of belief that would kind of bring together and make cohesive uh, a bunch of different people, give them a, a sense of direction, purpose in life, or whatever. Uh, or maybe it was used by some ruler or king to control his people and to pacify his people against rebellion, that sort of stuff. And well, I think that that's definitely been done in the past, is that political leaders and religious leaders have used religion as a controlling mechanism for, uh, for basically kind of like social engineering and to profit themselves and other such things, uh, to gain power, to maintain power over people. That certainly happened. But it doesn't make sense that that was the origin of religion. And nor does it make sense that religion is just merely a collection of myths or fairy tales. This also doesn't make sense. Because the myths and fairy tales, they could have been very random and very different than they ended up being. And it doesn't quite explain... Uh, what and why religion is. So, all of those things might be true to some degree, but they miss, like, the core. They miss the core that's there. And the core that I want to tell you about right here, which I've been thinking about a lot about this 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 week as I've been uh, working really hard on my enlightenment and studying a lot of consciousness uh, material, and this is the thing that you're really, really not going to like. You're really not going to like this. Your, your rational mind is not going to like this. Is that there is an absolute truth, and this absolute truth is accessible to human beings. 
Again, there is an absolute truth, and this absolute truth is accessible to human beings. And here's the really nasty bit that you're not going to like. It's not accessible to the rational mind. It is not accessible to the rational mind. The scientific rational mind hates this. It hates this idea. This idea is not something it wants to accept. So what I submit to you is that if your mind is rejecting this idea, and it's not even open to this possibility, then what you're being is you're being dogmatic. Now here I just stated this, but I want to go in and explain how this can be possible and why you're missing this. Why your rational mind is missing this. Because your rational mind is rejecting out of hand this idea that there could be something outside of the rational mind. It seems silly, it seems superstitious, it seems mystical, it seems, well, religious. And religious is a bad word. But I want to urge you to be a little bit more cautious and careful and open-minded here because um, I'm going to lay something on you that's going to be pretty deep. So here's how it works. I'll tell you exactly the structure of the core of religion. And my claim here is that this structure is actually true. This structure is actually true. So here's how it works. You've got a sense of self, of personal self. You believe that you're a body, and you believe that you're this mind and the brain inside the body. And you've got this personal story. You can remember the time that you were born and the way that you grew up and where you are now, and you believe you're going to die, and yada, 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 right? And that all makes pretty good sense, except there's one problem. And that problem is that if you look really carefully and really deeply, what you're going to realize is that this sense of self that you have is actually an illusion, and that there is no such thing as a sense of self. So the thing that you call you, the thing that you, the thing that you think you are most certainly, when we say your name, the thing that points to, well, that thing is actually a big confusion and a big mistake in your mind. So what's possible then is it, it's possible to basically jailbreak your brain, right? You know how they jailbreak cell phones to break out of the crappy operating system or whatever? Install whatever software you want. Well, what's empirically possible is to jailbreak your brain. And you can jailbreak the mind from the brain. Pretty cool. In doing so, what you discover is that the self, the self that you believe that you are, everything you believe that you perceive is actually not being perceived by a you. And this answers a very deep existential question. And the existential question that it answers is that it answers who you really are. You believe right now that you're this physical body. Well, what I'm telling you is that that's false. That's a false identification. You're identifying with your physical body in the same way that maybe a psychotic person might identify with being a, a chair or a tree or something. In the same way you're identifying with your body. It certainly feels very real, but it's not true. When you break through that illusion and you find what's true is you discover something, well, that's quite unfathomable and literally incommunicable. And that is that the self, the true self, not the false self, but the true self is nothing. And this nothing is a very special thing. This is not something to be dismissed lightly. Nothing here, I mean literally. You are literally nothingness. This cannot be believed or logically understood. It has to be directly experienced. You are the nothingness, so you are it. Once you realize it, you can actually be it. You can be the nothingness. So the self is nothing. Okay, that's step one. The second step is to, and by the way, when you experience that, that's called enlightenment. When you realize that, that's called enlightenment. So after you get your first enlightenment about yourself, then comes the next even bigger enlightenment. 
And that is answering existentially, what is existence? Have you ever wondered about that? What the hell is existence? How can existence even exist? You ever wondered about that? Well, what it turns out is that you can have an enlightenment experience that will reveal to you the absolute nature of existence. And what that absolute nature is, is nothingness. Existence and nothingness are the same. They arise out of each other. Or, more accurately, existence arises out of nothingness. And that nothingness doesn't go away, it's always there. This is referred to as the void in certain Buddhist traditions, or maybe Zen traditions, they call it the void. So all of reality comes from nothingness. Now this might seem like, oh, okay, that kind of maybe makes sense or whatever, but see, I'm not telling you here to believe it or to take it on as a theory. I'm telling you that you can actually get a direct encounter with this truth. The other enlightenment that you can have, there's multiple enlightenments that you can have, another enlightenment you can have is that other people, others around you, everyone you see, are also nothing, also nothingness. And what that means is that because you're nothing and they're nothing, that you and them are identical, the same, at an existential, metaphysical level. You're identical. So you could have that enlightenment experience. And then ultimately what you discover is you piece all these things together and you get a direct experience of the absolute truth. And the absolute truth is basically that existence arises out of nothing. This nothingness, this ultimate void is God. The word God refers to this nothingness because it's the source of everything, right? It's not a personal God. It's not a God with a beard. It's not a God as him or her, but it's God in the sense that it's the source of all reality. And this nothingness is a unity. It's one. And it has no space. It has no location. It has no distance. It has no size because nothingness doesn't have any of those qualities. What we're talking about here is not an idea of nothingness, which is something, but we're talking about literally nothingness. And what you discover is that you are nothing and God is nothing. And so because this, because of this, you are God. That right there is the core of every major religion. All major religions are grounded in the truth of no self. That's what I like to call it, the truth of no self. Christianity is founded on this, as is Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Taoism, Zen, even Sufism, and yogic practices in India and in the East. All of these different religions are really different ways, very roundabout ways often, to explain what I just explained to you. Now, there's an additional really big wrinkle in this whole thing, is that what I explained to you here is just like a vague, 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 vague story, still a story, not reality, about what reality is. Right? And so, just consider for a second, I know that what I said might sound crazy to you, might sound very implausible or whatever, but just consider for a second that if this mechanism that I explained is actually accurate and correct, it would certainly explain a whole hell of a lot about why religions are and how they are and how they came to be. Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it explain a whole hell of a lot if you look at religions through this lens. Let's take a look at it, right? 
But you have to take into consideration that this idea of no self, this truth of no self, as I call it, that this is something that has to be directly experienced. This is not something that can be spoken or logically analyzed. Why? Because when you think about nothingness, it's already something. What is the one thing that you cannot intellectualize about? It's nothingness. You can't intellectualize nothingness because when you're intellectualizing, that's something. So the problem here becomes that if you want to get at the nothingness, you can't do it through your conventional, practical, everyday, logical thinking. You can't do it through scientific thinking. You can't do it through language. And by the way, science is language. Science is language. You cannot do science without language. So, because of this, you have to be open to a radical new third alternative of understanding reality. What do I mean by a third alternative? Well, you've got one alternative, which is to conceptualize about it, right? You can create a model of how reality works, and that's what science loves to do, and that's what we do with even non-scientific pursuits. We create models. Religion creates models, too. We create models in our everyday life. We create maps of reality and all this kind of stuff. It helps creating these models. So you can create models and concepts, and you can think about reality. That's one way to understand reality. A second way, arguably even better and more direct, is to actually experience it with your own senses. First person experience. Who can doubt what they actually see? When you look up in the in the sky and you see the sun or the moon, it's really hard to doubt that that thing exists because you see it right there before your eyes. So experience is really nice. And you know, one of the crowning achievements of science is that it, what it did is that it founded its models on experience. So science is great because you actually get to look at what's there, reality, experience, and then you get to create a model, but that model, it's not just some any model you want to create, otherwise that would be a fairy tale. Uh, it's actually a model that's pinned down by experience, right? So it's limited, it's constrained, there's verifiability built into it. So that's real cool. And then what we do is we say, well, that's pretty much all we've got, right? You've got experience and you've got your conceptualizing of experience. That's how we know stuff. And, I mean, that's the end of the story, right? Well, what if it wasn't? What if there was a third way, a third way to know stuff? What would that way be, you might ask? Well, what if you could actually be the thing itself? Think about this. So, for example, when you're looking at my hand right now, you're seeing it, right? Now, the question is, you're looking at it, and you see it, and it looks like a hand to you. Now, the question is, to the hand itself, to the hand, what does the hand actually appear like? Does it appear the way it appears to you? Does it have colors and stuff? Or does it actually have its own being, which is different than the way that it appears to you? You're probably going to say, yeah, sure, it does, Leo. But what are you trying to say? That I can be this hand? How can I be the hand? It doesn't make much sense. Well, this is where the truth of no self becomes very important. Because the problem is, when you're identified with yourself and you believe that you're this right here, this body and this mind and these thoughts, well, then you're stuck. And you can only be this. You can't be anything else. Now, though, if you jailbreak your brain, if you really disidentify from everything in your experience, including your body and your thoughts and everything else, then this gives you the freedom to be everything and anything. I'm not saying this figuratively, I'm saying it quite literally. So this sounds pretty crazy, and it sounds like, well, it's just, just some sort of myth or something like that. But what I'm saying here is that you can actually do this in your own experience. It's not a myth, you don't need to go read a Bible or whatever to, to do this, you can actually, it, it can be done.
Now, the trick, though, is that it's difficult to do this. It's not quite easy. And why is that? Well, because you're extremely attached to your self, to your selfhood, to your self-image. And so this, this process of jailbreaking your mind from the brain, this is a very serious psychological undertaking. This does not happen easily because everything in your psyche resists it. In the same way that when you try to hack an iPhone or whatever, the software in the iPhone resists you hacking it, right? But there are hackers who are good enough to hack it. And then what they can do is they can do some remarkable stuff when they get rid of all those, all those limits that the, you know, the original phone manufacturers put on the damn thing. All those limits can be overcome. So it's kind of the same with your mind and your brain. Now, the problem here, though, is that, again, human beings think extremely dogmatically, right? Remember the original core problem we talked about at the beginning? Human beings are extremely dogmatic. Well, if this truth of no self is communicated to other people, because you can't communicate it, right? You can't communicate being. Being something, you have to be it. You can't communicate about it. Anything you communicate about is just a more story. So the only way to get and use this third alternative of being is to actually do the being yourself. But see, the problem is that because it's so difficult to actually jailbreak your own mind, that when you talk about these things to other people, what they do is they construct stories and they turn this stuff into belief systems, right? And then those beliefs, they turn into myths. And a lot of times the way that people talk about these things is through analogy because that's the only way you can talk about it. You can't talk about it directly. To talk about it directly would be to be the damn thing yourself. But see, I can't make you be it. You have to do it yourself. So this creates a really big problem because other forms of human knowledge can be easily spread. For example, if you want to write about mathematics, you can write some formulas in a book and you can explain everything and then you can print a million copies of this book and send it around the world and create classrooms full of you know, calculus books or whatever that will teach calculus. And problem solved. Now, how do you communicate the truth of no self? Well, you can write it in a book, but the problem is that the person reading that book, just by reading that, that doesn't jailbreak his mind. So he still believes he's the self. And he's so dogmatic, he doesn't understand he's dogmatic. So what he does is he conflates reality with a belief system. And he thinks that just believing in it is enough. So he reads the book, he reads about no self, he reads about some God idea or nothingness or whatever, and then he turns it into a belief. And so the only way that you can mass spread the truth of no self is by turning it into a belief system, which makes it necessarily false. You can turn it into a myth. If you want to stay true to the truth of no self, the only way to do that is through silence. You can't say anything. So this presents a really big problem because it turns out then that you can't mass distribute the truth of no self. This is one of the few truths that cannot be mass distributed, unlike most of science and all, all the other stuff that we know. All right, so this should, this should start to be clicking in your mind. You should start to get this, oh, aha, right? As all the things you know about religion start clicking into place when you're looking at it through this lens that I'm sharing with you. Let me just continue a little bit more. So now think back 2,000 years ago, what life was like, or maybe even 5,000 years ago. Back then, our understanding of science and scientific principles and sound philosophical reasoning processes um, was non-existent, right? Human beings at that point did not develop good practical analytical thinking skills. So there was not a really good scientific way, very careful, methodical way to explain what I'm explaining to you now. In fact, human beings weren't really clear about all the trickiness that the psyche presents. 
the whole idea of a psyche or a subconscious mind, these ideas, they're just a couple hundred years old. A couple hundred. Think what it was like to live life two or 5,000 years ago. It's like you were living in the dark. You were living in a totally different reality. You did not understand reality the way that we understand it now through science. And so, therefore, people resorted to mythology and storytelling to talk about this truth of no self. Now, how did this work in practice? Well, you have some extremely hardcore, really fucking hardcore guys. Maybe one in a million or one out of ten million that will break through and see the truth of no self by jailbreaking their mind. These were the mystics, these were the yogis, these were the Jesus Christs and uh, the Buddhas. These were the sages, these were the swamis. <laughs> There's so many different names for these kinds of people, right? These were the Zen masters before there even were Zen masters. Um, you got to figure this is how it happened. And then what happened is when they break through this and they, they see this amazing, mind-blowing shift in perspective on life, what they do, of course, is that, well, some of them remain silent and say nothing. But some of them want to share with others. Because it's like, oh my God, you're living in a fucking dream. You're living in a fucking dream. You're mistaken about how your whole life works and you don't even know it. You don't, you don't even have a suspicion of not even an inkling. And if I'm the yogi here and I'm sitting here and I'm looking at you, I'm like, it's just preposterous. It's preposterous. I've broken out of the matrix. I want to help some other people break out of the matrix. And so what I do is I try to explain it to you in the best way that I can. But again, I can't explain it directly. I need you to experience it. But the problem is that it's pretty difficult for you to jailbreak your own mind. And you know, 5,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, the process of jailbreaking your mind and achieving an enlightenment experience was not well studied, was not well known, and it really was just kind of like something that happened almost by blind luck. So there was no reliable process to give to others for having them achieve enlightenments of their own and see the truth for themselves. So all that you could do is you could tell stories. And so that's what people did is they told stories. Right? And as they told these stories, this idea of no self was explained and tailored to the local culture. Because the way that we understand the truth of no self here in the West, in America, let's say, might be one way. And if you tell it to us in some sort of cloaked and veiled Indian culture way, then we're not gonna we're not gonna be receptive to it. So it has to be told in an American way. And if we tell it in Europe, it has to be told in a European way. And if we tell it in the Middle East, it has to be told in a Middle Eastern way. And if we tell it in India, it'll be told in an Indian way. And in Africa, it'll be told in an African way. And so on. And so what you have here is you have the same truth, but it's tailored to the culture and to the era and the time in which this truth is discovered. Now the truth is absolute, but Every culture is different, right? And every culture has stuff that it likes, it doesn't like. And dogmatic and closed-minded people, they're not very tolerant people. So if you want to explain this stuff to them, you have to really tailor it in such a way that their mind, their limited mind, will find it palatable. Palatable, right? It's like giving someone a pill that tastes bitter but to make them swallow it, you have to like coat it in sugar, sugar coating the pill. So in a sense, that's what religion tries to do. Right? And also in a sense, no matter what explanation you give of no self, it doesn't really matter because every explanation is wrong. It's not like there's one right explanation. The only right explanation is to actually have the person become the truth themselves and get it for themselves. Everything else is already wrong. So in a sense, you could say that you know every twist and turn that religions put on it is just like a, a teaching mechanism, right? It's just a tool. Now the question is, are you going to be receptive to this tool? Is it going to help you to achieve enlightenment for yourself, or won't it? 
maybe it'll get you lost in stories and ideas and looking somewhere where you'll never find enlightenment. And what ended up happening, very ironically actually, is that most of religions devolved into exactly this. Is you just had people talking and talking and talking about this stuff and believing it and creating dogmas around it, fighting over it and all this stuff, getting psychologically invested in it without realizing what the hardcore mystics were really talking about. If you go and you actually study every major religion, what you're going to discover is that there's a hardcore mystical strand. It's called esoteric, right? The esoteric strand within every religion, it exists. You'll find it in Christianity. You'll find it in Judaism with uh, Kabbalah. You'll find it in, uh, in Islam with stuff like Sufis. Uh, you'll find it in, in Hinduism and you'll... Um, You'll find it with yoga and all this stuff. You find like the hardcore mystics. Those are actually the people who are living religion in a true way. But the problem is that they seem very radical. They seem very anti-mainstream. And that is, of course, how it has to be. Because the truth of no self is very radical and it's very anti-mainstream. You can't mainstream it by definition. It's completely individual. It makes the spread of religion impossible. It really does. So you have these hardcore, mystic, esoteric, splinter groups, very tiny little niche splinter groups within every religion. And usually what happens is that they're marginalized. Those people are demonized. They're killed. They're driven into caves and into the woods and all this stuff because there's no way that they can compete with the hyped-up bullshit that's generated when you take the truth of no self and you spend a bunch of crazy, mind-blowing stories about it, right? And you give it to the dogmatic mind. The dogmatic mind cannot understand no self, but it can very easily take no self, uh, spin some tales about it, and then understand those, and latch on and cling to those, which is exactly what religions do. So that's basically how it works in my mind. When I look at religions, it's very clear to me through this lens how it looks. The closer you get yourself to enlightenment, the more your awareness is raised about some of these issues with self-image and self-concept and jailbreaking your mind and uh, how nothingness really works, that nothingness can't be somethingness that you can't perceive nothingness because a perception of nothingness would be something and not nothing. Um, when you start to learn about the, the problems with conceptualization and the fact that to think about something, you need to use a language system to think about it, and that language systems have inherent biases and problems and challenges. And uh, when you start to look at all this stuff, you start to see from a very, very clear perspective, like, oh, of course. Of course there's these religions. Of course they work the way they work. Of course people buy into them. Of course. Right? And the, the reason you say of course is because you recognize in yourself that dogmatism. That dogmatism that a fanatical religious person has, uh, that dogmatism is in you. It's in you. You just deny it. Maybe you hide it a little bit better than that person. Maybe you don't take it to some really far-fetched extreme. Maybe you don't act on it as much, but it's still there in you. And the way you can recognize it is just by actually, uh, by feeling it, right? You can feel that dogmatism. When someone starts disturbing your worldview or your beliefs, maybe with a video like this one, what starts to happen is you actually, you experience emotions, strong emotions. Distaste, fear, anger, bitterness, uncomfort, you know, feelings of discomfort, um, demonizing of the other person, burning the person at the stake, or whatever, creating a straw man argument out of what they're saying, closing your ears, clicking the off button, uh, telling your friends how stupid the idea was that you heard, or writing a nasty comment, or you know, whatever, whatever means you use to, to protect your worldview. You notice inside, though, that this is a, it's like a dirty feeling when this is happening in you. It's a dirty feeling. Sometimes it's hard to, to pinpoint it 
But if you're very self-honest, you can say, oh, yep, yeah, there it is. There's that dirty feeling inside me. It's inside you. Uh, so in wrapping this up, one thing I want to address is atheism. Right? So you might, you might ask, well, Leo, what about atheism? So is atheism wrong? Is it false? Is it true? What's going on? Well, in a sense, it's like the atheist is half right, right? Because what does the atheist say? The atheist says there's no God. Well, the religious, the true religious person, what he wants to say is that there is a God, but this God is nothingness. So in a sense, the, the atheist and the true mystic agree, right? Because it's like, um, there is no God, but the fact that there is a nothingness becomes the God. See, nothingness, it seems like nothingness is this, oh, it's just like, it's nothingness. So that's, that's you know, that's kind of pointless and shallow and hollow and there, there's not much meaning there. Um, but actually nothing, this is, this is a profound, absolute, existential nothingness. It, it's hard to appreciate how powerful this nothingness is because this nothingness is the source of all life. It's the source of all reality. Um, so because it's so profound and because it's so awe-inspiring, people call it God. Now, the atheist could say, well, there is no God. Um, but see, if you take that atheist and you actually give him an enlightenment experience for real and you get him to feel directly to be the nothingness, um, uh, he is going to have a real difference of opinion, a real difference of attitude, a real difference of perspective. Things are really going to change for him. And it's not going to be the typical kind of atheism that you see, you know, people talking about. So what about science? Is science wrong? Well, science is great. And with science, we can build a lot of cool stuff and technology and whatever, and we can learn about electrons and protons and all sorts of cool shit. But there's a really big problem at the core of science, right? Yes, science is very practical. There's a really big core problem, and that's the matter qualia problem. And this is a problem that science has never addressed. It's a problem that really science skirts all the time. And my current understanding is that science will never, ever, ever, ever be able to rectify this problem. Here's the problem, is that science says that there's physical matter and that there's a physical world. And that sounds all great, you know, we've got protons and electrons and quarks and strings and all this energy and whatever other physical things you want to talk about. But science says nothing about our perceptions. So the things that you are considering most real in your life, your feelings, your emotions, the colors that you see, the smells that you smell, the tastes and the sounds, and the qualitative aspects of all that, those things are not atoms or energy or strings or quarks or molecules or anything else like that. If we cut open your brain, we're not going to you're not going to find the color orange in there. If we cut open your brain, we're not going to find the feeling of love or happiness in there. And if we cut open your brain, we're not going to find the sound of, uh, of a guitar in there. And yet these entities, these experiential entities, are very, very real to us. Uh, the thing that science does with this problem is that it really kind of skirts it under the rug. It doesn't like to look at it. Sometimes it'll deny the existence of qualia altogether. Or sometimes it'll come up with some ham-fisted way of taking matter and quality and somehow combining them together and explaining something away. But in the end, it doesn't really resolve this issue. Now, maybe I'm wrong on this. Maybe in a thousand years, science will resolve this issue. But from where I stand now, and from what I understand about enlightenment, is that you're not going to be able to resolve this issue. If you want to resolve this issue, what you have to do is you have to become enlightened. And then the issue resolves completely like that. So the resolution of the issue is enlightenment. But then what that does is that really throws science on its head, really starts to get you questioning some core assumptions that science makes. All right. So real quickly, I want to just go through and explain a couple of 
key terms and concepts that religions rely on pretty heavily. I want to tell you exactly what they mean in no bullshit terms. So the first one is, what is God? God is absolute nothingness. It's absolute. It's real. You can encounter it. You can be it. You actually are it. You just don't realize it yet because you're identified with your body. So that's God. God is not some bearded man in the clouds or whatever the fuck your religions tell you he is. Number two, heaven and hell. What does this mean? Is there an actual heaven and hell? No. Uh, hell is where you presently live. Hell refers to your current existence of being stuck and identified with your body. That is literally hell uh, because you suffer for it every single day. Uh, you can't avoid the suffering because you live with a, a body that's going to die, right? So there's going to be suffering. Uh, heaven is the disidentification of yourself with your body and becoming absolute nothingness. You know what's cool about being absolutely no one and nothing is that nothing can harm you. And nothingness, it exists absolutely all the time forever. So there's no worry about your death or whatever other problems happening to you. So this makes you untouchable. And that is heaven. Okay, next idea is faith. Faith, what does faith mean? Well, faith is actually very interesting. This is a very interesting realization I just had last week from, from this workshop that I did. What faith is, is your ability to open your mind up to the third possibility. So, you know, we have concepts and we have experience. The third possibility is being, right? This, the third possibility of being, well, this is something that it's very hard for the rational mind to open itself up to. And what I've literally found in myself is that I have to have faith in it. Now, this sounds like a dirty word to you if you're a rational person. It's like, faith, no, I don't want to have faith, Leo. That's for stupid people. And I agree with you, except that in this case, if you actually want to have an enlightenment experience, you're going to need faith. You're not going to do it without faith. Um, and so it's kind of like, well, is faith really that scary? Are you so dogmatic that you're going to be clinging to this idea of never having faith in the third option and therefore never experiencing the third option? Or are you going to have the faith to take that, you know, that leap of faith and try to go for the direct experience and actually get the direct experience, actually be the thing and then see what I'm talking about for real for you. Uh, so faith is important there. Next term is good and evil. What do these things mean? These are not absolute terms. These are relative terms. These are metaphorical terms. So what is evil, first of all? Evil is selfishness. Evil is identification with your body and all the actions that you do to live and perpetuate your ego. That's evil. That's literally what evil refers to. So also the devil, we should bring the devil in here too. What does the devil refer to? The devil refers to you. The way that you're presently living your egoic life, so you are you are the devil, right? Because you're tricking yourself. The devil is deception. You're deceiving yourself about being this body and this mind here, which is just not true. Um, and then what is good? Good is everything you do from a selfless state. Good is when you become God, is when you see that you're nothingness, and therefore you also see that you're everything. And you start behaving in a good way, why? Because when you see that everything is you, you want to treat it well. The reason you treat other people or even physical objects poorly, the reason you litter, the reason you steal something, the reason you lie or deceive is because you believe that, well, I'm here and I need to protect this, and that thing over there is not important. Screw that. So you do something to improve this at the expense of that. Well, if you literally believe that you're everything, you don't want to hurt anything at the expense of anything else. And then you're good. How about afterlife? What does afterlife mean? Well, afterlife means understanding the absolute truth of nothingness, because when you understand the absolute truth of nothingness, then you are in the afterlife already. Why? Because you can't be destroyed. You're untouchable. 
nothingness lasts forever. And lastly, what does salvation mean? Salvation means being saved from your wicked state. So metaphorically speaking, if we say that you're the devil right now, then what I could do, if I'm enlightened or whatever, is that I could communicate this truth of enlightenment to you, sort of. Maybe within you, something will recognize a spark of truth here, and you'll come towards the light, and you'll try to go for the enlightenment experience. Maybe you'll have some faith, and you'll open up yourself to the third possibility, and you'll have a direct experience, and then you will become good from evil, and that will be a true salvation, a remarkable rebirth. I'm being very poetic and metaphorical here. But that's exactly what the Bible is, is a very, very loose, very, 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 very loose, very, very, very metaphorical, very, 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 very poetic way of describing some of the stuff that I've been talking about here. And just a couple of last points to wrap up is that everything I said here can be directly experienced for you. So the reason that what I'm telling you here is not religion, um, is that what I'm telling you here, I invite you to go and realize in your own life. You can verify it, right? I'm making a verifiable claim. Verifiable claim. And of course, the irony of all this is that, is that religion is really a terrible way to get to know God. The people who are the most religious are the furthest away from God. That's the whole irony of this thing. But of course, that means that if you just become atheistic, you know, the, like the typical atheist, the dogmatic atheist, that also puts you very far away from God. So if you really want to understand this stuff and you want to be one with God and you are God, then what you can do, because you're nothingness, is you can, uh, you can attempt to attain an enlightenment experience or two. And then in that process, you will become religious but in a non-religious way, in a very non-dogmatic way. You're not going to hold a single belief. You're not going to need to have any theory. You're not going to need to uh, partake in any ritual. You're not going to need to pray or to meditate or to do anything at all because your absolute nature is nothingness, and that absolute nature is the same forever and always. And it has no place. It has no space. It has no time boundaries. It has... No problems whatsoever. And it's the most beautiful truth that you can discover in this life. So what I really recommend here, even though it sounds like I'm here promoting religion or whatever, um, hopefully you can see that this video is very nuanced. I didn't take any sides here. I really kind of um, carved out a new space. New space for you. Hopefully this space looks cool and appealing and you want to go and try to Maybe experience a bit of it for yourself, taste a bit of it for yourself. What I recommend for you is that if you are a religious person, and if you do hold a single religious belief of any kind, that you drop all your religious beliefs. Because every belief that you have, religious ones or scientific ones or whatever other kind you've got, all of these are holding you back from realizing your true nature. And now, hopefully, you can appreciate why true mystics are so rare. Because it's extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to let go of all the beliefs that must be let go of in order to realize this truth. It's really a scary fucking business. It's a scary fucking business. It's not an easy business. This is going to be one of the most difficult and emotionally grueling and challenging endeavors that you will undertake in your life. And it might take you many, many, many years and much, much, much struggle to do it. And you might even invest all that time and energy and you might fail. So, uh, so yeah, some good news for you there. I'll end on a happy note. All right, this is Leo. I'm signing off. Post me your comments down below. Click the like button, please. Share the video with a friend. And finally, come sign up to my newsletter right here at actualize.org. It's a free newsletter. I release new videos 
every single week on, oh man, all sorts of personal development topics from very abstract ones to very esoteric ones to very practical ones. So if you're interested in really getting a a really deep and profound understanding of life and your own psychology and use it to create amazing performance in your own life, which is what all I'm about is amazing performance in my own life, then um, come sign up and check that out. Stay tuned for more.